Fold It is a multiplayer online game where the players are competing and collaborating to try to find well-folded protein structures. The puzzles that the players are working on in the game are actual real protein structures that scientists are interested in seeing what the player's gameplay produces. When the player starts a puzzle, they start with um, you know, usually a partially folded protein that's uh, folded up to some extent, but there are, are things that are wrong with it. It's not actually a, the right answer yet. We don't actually know for these proteins what the right answer is. We can design the game with a, a structure that you're supposed to make in mind because we don't know what that is. So we organize the game as a competition so that the players would always be setting higher and higher goals for each other. As the players are playing, we're logging the structures that they're finding, the solutions that they're coming up with as well. And then we go back and we analyze those and look at how the players did and what they came up with. One of the, the more exciting results that we had recently was where the players were actually able to solve the crystal structure of a protein that scientists have been working on for, for several years and were unable to solve either with their experimental methods or some of the state-of-the-art computational methods. Games are really powerful kind of motivator for people and uh, trying to, to harness the power that, that people spend playing games and to put that towards solving real-world problems is a really um, a great goal to have and to show that, that gamers can help to, to solve real problems and have some impact in the real world. The image that you're looking at is a series of sections from a mouse eye. It's oriented so that uh, the optic nerve is at the upper right-hand portion of the image. And what we've done is we've placed the tissue, we've embedded, in plastic, embedded it in plastic, and then started shaving off portions of the eye a few nanometers at a time until we get through the sclera and all the layers of retina. The retina is a multi-laminar structure, and we wanted to see each layer in the retina and probe them with molecules designed to detect small molecules and then visualize them. And the resulting RGB image that you see is a mathematically true color image of those small molecular signals in mammalian retina. So we were interested in determining uh, what neurons are present in tissues and how they're wired together. So. These technologies, the computational molecular phenotyping technologies, are uh, an effort to look at a metabolic fingerprint in retina and correlate that with the identity in another set of technologies we're developing here uh, based in connectomics. And you want to know how neural systems are connected, how neural systems are wired together. And it turns out in the retina, it's sort of a glorious, you know, compact model for connectivity where each type of neuron is connected to other types of neurons according to very specific rules. So if we need to know how those neurons are connected, we need to know who they are. And so rather than a sort of a stochastic approach to sort of labeling neurons ad hoc, we can label neurons and identify their absolute identity. And then we can go to the ultrastructure and figure out what their circuitry is. When you look at the universe on very large scales, on millions of light years, you see that the galaxies are arranged in a, in a very particular pattern. It looks like a foam, a cosmic foam. So when you have bubbles, uh, with regions that are empty with no galaxies, and in the boundaries of these, of these bubbles is where the galaxies are located. What we see is only the luminous parts of this network, the light that comes from the stars. There is a whole system underneath that we cannot see. It's a system of dark matter. And the strings that you see on the left of the poster are these strings of dark matter. How this dark matter is actually flowing from places with low density in places with high density. And it's, you, you see huge streams that there are tens of millions of light years in length. So in the poster, you can see how these bubbles are actually made by large streams of matter. How matter is streaming away from, from, from centers with low density into the edges of the bubbles, and in the bubbles, the matter accumulates, and that's where you see galaxies, where you form galaxies. So the poster shows different aspects of, the, of this process, how the, the universe evolves, and matter starts accumulating by gravity, and form this cosmic web, this cosmic system of bubbles. This 
rotating 3D model shows a single cell similar to the trillions of cells that make up your body. This particular cell came from the pancreas of a mouse and it's used as a biological model to study diabetes in humans. Fading the outer membrane unveils the cell's internal organs called organelles. The round insulin secreting vesicles color coded here in blue dominate the interior. 12,128 of them in total. Fading these blue vesicles reveals a network of mitochondria, color-coded in green, sprawled about the yellow, color-coded nucleus. Scientists and general audiences alike can learn a great deal about biology by comparing internal structural differences between cells harvested from different environments, that is, from different parts of your body or from different life cycle stages. But even comparisons that seem obvious in a single model can deceive, let alone across multiple models. For example, approximately how much of the cell's total volume do you think that this yellow nucleus occupies? About 12%, 26%, or about 39%? How much of the cell's total volume do you think that the green mitochondria occupy? About 7%, 42%, or about 68 percent? Believe it or not, the correct answers are closest to 12 percent for the nucleus and only 7 percent for the mitochondria, much lower than most people infer by glancing directly at these representations of the data. A tool we've developed allows scientists and general audiences alike to compare and contrast multiple descriptive parameters of visually complicated 3D structures, like this cell, at a glance. By organizing the organelles and averaging their volumes, we can represent the cell as a simplified 3D graph that retains qualities of the native model. Here, a viewer gets a gut-level impression of the relative volumes of each of the organelles, far closer to the correct values, but they can still appreciate that this data represents information about a cell rather than something more mathematically abstracted. The same tool enables us to rapidly compare otherwise similar-looking cells. The two cells on the left, collected after glucose stimulation, are smaller and have a different organelle distribution than the two unstimulated cells on the right. This information is much easier to absorb by looking at the simplified cells on the bottom row, rather than by mentally merging the information from the original models in the top row with the quantification information in the pie chart shown in the middle row. After highlighting comparisons with the simplified information, the cell can morph back to its original shape, reminding audiences of the complex interplay of randomness and specific interaction in these structures that enables life to exist. <laughs>